The Tasks of Schools and the Threefold Social Organism, a lecture to the Union of Young Teachers. I am extremely pleased to be speaking to members of the teaching profession. My destiny has led me to work in various professions, and I try to understand what lives in different professions and social classes, especially within the confusion and chaos of modern times. I feel particularly at home with teachers, since I taught for many years, although in a private situation, which may not have been the ideal situation. Consequently, I also feel urged to speak specifically to that profession about reforming the human conditions that have developed. When we look at the essence of current social demands and at clear or shadowy insights into what we must do in the future, it can be said that any reformation of our life would suffer the greatest imaginable loss if we fail to heed what teachers have to say about current needs and about what may be heard throughout the civilized world. If teachers did not direct their efforts toward improving the human condition, it would become obvious that any attempt to reform human institutions would itself require immediate improvement and could not possibly lead to any improvement. From what I have to say, you will realize that I object to a number of things in today's educational institutions, but I ask that you don't take what I say as criticism of today's teachers. I definitely recognize that teachers suffer greatly in today's schools, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that they may often ache and yet remain unaware of their pain because of life's pressures. Therefore, the deepest and most significant discussions of the so-called social question can take place with teachers. Although it is seldom recognized, teachers have a tremendous personal interest in what comes of the calls for socialization now and in the near future. We may have misgivings about the current party programs being circulated, but we are not interested in discussing them specifically. Nevertheless, those more or less radical socialist programs lead to other programs for quote-unquote socializing the school system. If we were to socialize the educational system as those programs propose, the result would only substantiate the fears that many anxious people feel about socialist reform. Few people recognize that the implementation of socialist party programs for education would result in pure pedagogical madness. Although that may sound somewhat radical, and I apologize for that, I am interested only in developing an objective, practical idea. I am certainly not interested in working in any way toward any party-like program. These introductory remarks raise the question about our current educational system. Where can we see the results of that educational system in ordinary life, that modern practical life from which there are universal calls for reformation. If our interest in education is more than just theoretical, if with our heart and soul we are interested in the school system as the most important factor in human development, we must acknowledge that people who have no real insight into the needs and possibilities of life sometimes establish educational programs in a dubious way. Some people believe that those who want to reform life are capable of only the worst changes. We must ask those with such beliefs whether or not the souls of those they fear so much were educated in today's schools. We look with fear at the proletariat today, and we have to admit that our anxiety is justified. If we are not too short-sighted, however, we have to admit that the proletariat went through our schools and that those schools produced the proletariat. The desires of the proletariat and also the errors in those desires should certainly help us understand the expression, quote, by their fruits you shall know them, unquote. I'm not trying to be superficially argumentative, but I want to point out the historical and cultural problem inherent in the modern educational system. We need to be clear that during the last three or four centuries, in particular the 19th century, 
A new kind of human being has arisen as the proletariat, a type of human being whose physical, soul, and spiritual makeup did not exist in earlier times. In contrast to other members of human society, the essence of modern members of the proletariat is that, to a much greater extent than before, their whole existence as human beings hangs in the air. From a pedagogical perspective, this is particularly interesting. Concerning their own existence, individual members of the modern proletariat would have to say, If I lose my job or am forced to give it up, I confront a void. They no longer feel connected with what binds human society. In that regard, we must also say that while the proletariat developed, school education was incapable of developing a complete human being. It is certainly not the fault of the teachers. That fault lies with the school's dependence on the state and economic forces. During the time just preceding our own, the growing child could have been worked with out of a genuine understanding of human development, but teachers were caught between two forces which were not always compatible with the teacher's own view of how to educate children. Today, in progressive schools that developed out of earlier times, teachers are caught between the parents and the state. Of course, there are always exceptions, and no single word completely describes all cases or any individual case. In general, however, we can say that modern teachers are presented with spoiled children in the classroom, and when they graduate them from school, the state immediately sucks out exactly what the teachers tried to give to the souls of those children. Teachers today are caught between those two ex- these two extremes, which are incompatible with what really needs to happen in schools. If teachers are really aware of their profession, then they can only groan under the burden of these two distortions of the children they teach, distortions caused by the parents and by the state. Of course, that is an extreme description of the problem, but do we ever receive any children from the parents other than those the parents themselves have raised? Children are brought up by the parents with all of their own prejudices. They are colored by all that parents carry in their attitudes and souls. Children are the product of their class and situation. On the other side, when we graduate children from school, we turn them loose into human life, sending them into a state-controlled society. The meaning of this is clear, particularly now, when humanity finds itself in such a terrible situation. We have experienced major misfortune, and we will experience even more. Haven't we seen something in our misfortune that we might have seen in better times if our insight had been sufficient? Haven't we seen that the essential characteristic of modern people is that inner strength of the soul was not developed during childhood, an inner strength of the soul that could help them move into life without life's destiny breaking their thinking, feeling, and willing? people do not realize the extent to which broken people, broken human beings, exist in every social class. We see it in the dark, vague thoughts and ideas that modern people throughout the civilized world have about the terrible events that have befallen us. Is it possible for anyone to imagine how this occurred? Is it still possible for anyone to understand life? Is there anyone who still feels strong enough to take a truly active role in life? We don't realize how much our contemporaries are really broken human beings. We need to ask why our schools have not been effective in giving human beings what is needed to firmly grasp life so that they are not broken by life and destiny. If schools had been allowed to spend more time teaching children what they need for a firm foundation in life, the situation today would be much different. However, they did not, that did not happen. Schools could have given people something, but those who are privileged and belong to the leading upper classes of society do not place people in life according to their accomplishments in school, but according to family, relationships, protectionism, and similar things. They make sure that young people move into one or another position according to their connections. 
The only <coughs> exceptions to this are those of the proletariat. Consequently, the proletarian is the real modern human being for the school. Proletarian children cannot be spoiled as much by the parents. Other things could do that, but not the parents, because they don't have the time for them. When proletariat children leave school, they do not enter human society through family connections, protectionism, and so on, but must enter life through what is contained within their own souls. The proletariat, those who are let loose into human society and depend only on themselves, is therefore in a very different situation than people of higher social classes. It is this that has given our schools their particular flavor, and we must now give this some consideration. That is also why teachers need to work on our current major social problems. The question of <clears throat> how we should shape human beings for life is being asked in very new ways. How can we teach in such a way that children develop their inner forces while attending school? How can we teach in a way that develops their forces of thinking, feeling, willing, making these forces strong enough in later life so that life's destiny cannot break them? These questions arise with new urgency when we consider the proletariat. How should we raise children? How should we teach them in school? <clears throat> Such questions have assumed new meaning. That is why teachers must decide how children must develop in school in order to enter life. Various party programs and opinions give us only a rather vague idea of what we now need. We see that modern people consider such questions by looking particularly at the school programs and ideas that socialists present. We only need to look at a few main points of those socialist ideas and programs for schools. Some socialist leaders emph emphasize, for example, the unified school, <clears throat> which should not be uniform. There should be as m much differentiation as possible in order to consider individual human capacities and interests. Socialists demand this by stating their desire for a differentiated curriculum in the unified school, but a unity in the organization. <clears throat> they mean that the unified school should be organized uniformly. The organizational form of the school should, therefore, not consider human individuality. Well then, how should we introduce that aspect? <clears throat> it is very odd that such a school program can come from socialist groups at all, simply because socialists, with their materialistic understanding of history, always stress that the human being is completely the product of external conditions. They always emphasize that the human being is not at all influenced by moral, ethical, aesthetic, or religious concepts. Socialism, in its Marxist papacy, calls all of that, ethical, moral, religious, and aesthetic views, merely an ideological superstructure. <clears throat> Socialists view reality as an organization of economic relationships. They see the human being in the same way. Everything else in the human soul dissolves into an ideological superstructure. Thus, socialism presents a school program that demands uniformity in organization and specialization in the curriculum. The curriculum would then bring what is, from their perspective, a more or less ideological superstructure. The organization would provide a situation in which to place the child to be formed into a human being. When socialists demand such uniformity of organization, what they are really demanding, according to the basic ideas of socialism, is uniformity in all of human nature, since any differentiation within the curriculum results only in the object of that differentiation being merely an ideological superstructure. Such a program demonstrates the contradictions that worm their way into current demands and the real results of such contradictions. But, as for the demands themselves, can we do anything to discourage them? There is really nothing we can do about them. They are there. Humanity, at its present stage of development, has reached a certain level of awareness, a certain attitude in the soul expressed by such proletarian demands. Those demands are merely a signal that we must renew education in a way that is very different than how the proletariat imagines it. 
through continuous development, a certain inner impulse has overtaken humankind, and that impulse has long been expressed in two words. But those words have become mere clichés, only slogans. Those words are democracy and socialism. These words arise with increasing strength from the foundations of human development. Now, although many foolish things are said about democracy and socialism, we must nevertheless admit that both are rising with increasing strength from human foundations. There are increased demands for state democratization and economic socialization. There is nothing we can do about those demands, since they are essential demands arising from the development of humankind. It is our task to take a reasonable position. Just what do demands for democracy and socialism indicate? They mean that, more than ever before, the individual human will must guide all activity of state and economy. Through democracy, individuals, and this includes the subjugated proletariat, seek greater participation in state affairs than ever before. Through socialization, people hope for a more individual, a more personal, broader influence on the economy. We only need to recall how it was in earlier times, and we can easily see that human society was much more cohesive then. Individuals had a greater tendency to bow to tradition, necessity and precedent. They tended to bow to the demands of those in higher positions or other authorities. Now people want to be freed from subjugation to authority through democracy and socialism. <clears throat> in regard to those specific socialist demands, what does society really require of schools? It requires the socialization of the school. People think that what occurs between adults in the realm of legal rights and economics should, perhaps in a milder form, also occur in the schools. A proposal, written by a socialist theoretician, also says that we should eliminate things in the future. These days everyone wants to eliminate things. This is what concerns people. The creation of something new is less interesting. Socialists want to eliminate the school principal's authority. To a certain extent, they also want to limit the authority of the teacher. And there is even talk of student-administered schools with teachers as colleagues. By removing the principal and the school board, they believe that children will become particularly well-suited to democracy and socialism. This means creating for children what actually arises as a human developmental necessity in adult social relationships. However, they have forgotten something, and this can be seen as a deficiency in modern psychologists. A good psychologist, someone who understands the soul, would never think that just because we loosen the bonds between adults, we should do that for children as well. A good psychologist would say exactly the opposite, that if we must now loosen adult social bonds so that we have more democracy and socialism, then there must be an even greater demand that we raise children so that later they have a capacity for democracy and socialism. If, however, we raise children in a school where democracy and socialism define the organization, later in life they will most likely be unfit for democracy and socialism. I am convinced that good psychologists who are serious about socialism and democracy would say, concerning human development, that in the feelings of children there is even greater reason to sow seeds that democracy and socialism cannot remove later on. <clears throat> this leads us to the basic questions of teaching methods or matters of pedagogy, because pedagogy must have a new face in the future. Pedagogy will have to begin with a deep understanding of human nature itself. In the future, in order to teach children effectively, we will have to study human nature much more deeply than is currently possible. Our natural sciences have had major triumphs in the last four centuries. Those familiar with its conscientious methods know what scientific direction and research have given humanity in the last four centuries. Nevertheless, we cannot gain an understanding of the human being through conventional science, particularly when conventional science is concerned with fulfilling its own ideals.
we will never understand the human being through conventional science. Using concepts based on observing nature, we can never recognize in ourselves what places us above the rest of nature. We can never recognize the spirit and soul. It is understandable, therefore, that in an age when science has reached a certain pinnacle, understanding of the human being continues to regress, especially in Western civilization. This is something Eastern civilization accuses us of strongly. Those who understand science as we have spoken of it today know that the true nature of the human being disintegrates when examined scientifically. Not only does human nature slip through the fingers of conventional science, but scientific thinking and its picture of the world have taken over modern human consciousness. It lives in every newspaper editorial and is a controlling factor in groups interested in today's needs. It also illustrates a significant dilemma. I could give you many examples, but I will present only one. There is currently an important scientist, Oskar Hertwig, who in his area of biology is very good, perhaps one of today's greatest and most important biologists. <coughs> many years ago he wrote a book titled The Development of Organisms, a refutation of the Darwinian theory of chance. From a scientific perspective, this is a very beautiful and important book. This unfortunate man, however, got the idea that he should write a book about social issues. But that book is complete nonsense. It is pure rubbish. This is a typical example. It is now possible to have a deep understanding of science and scientific methods and know nothing at all about social and ethical questions in which human beings are far above nature. Because pedagogical thinking in particular is gripped by scientific thinking, people no longer really see the becoming, developing human being. <clears throat> the developing human being will be the greatest pedagogical enigma in the future. I am very much aware that what I have to say will seem quite obvious to many, but these days we too seldom consider the obvious. There is an expression, and like many expressions, it is correct when used properly and otherwise completely false. This expression is, quote, nature makes no leaps, unquote. But nature makes leaps everywhere. When a green leaf becomes a colorful flower petal, nature makes a leap. When the colorful flower petal becomes the pistol, nature once again leaps. Nature makes nothing but leaps. When considered in sufficient depth, we see that it is the same in human life. Young human beings have three clearly separate periods of life. The first includes early childhood until the change of teeth. The change in the human organism that accompanies the change of teeth is much greater than modern physiology realizes. The entire nature of the human being as it develops from birth until the change of teeth changes considerably in the spirit and soul realm and to a lesser extent in the physical body after the change of teeth. The second period of life begins with the change of teeth and continues until puberty. The third continues from puberty until the early twenties. A more exact study of the human being based on their inner characteristics will need to be a part of anthropology in the future and will form the basis of methods for a real education. During the first period of life, there is an aspect of growth that overshadows everything else for the developing child, that is, the child as imitator. Children have a tendency to imitate whatever anyone does, including facial expressions, ways of holding things, and degrees of dexterity. <clears throat> this goes much farther than people re recognize. The effects of one person on another are much deeper than people generally realize. If our actions are those of good human beings when we are with children, they assume our gestures, goodness, capacity to love and good intentions. This is particularly true when they begin to learn language. Whatever is ensouled by the parents and others in the child's surroundings floods into that growing human being. Children completely adjust to and become like their surroundings because the principle of imitation is the controlling factor in human nature until the change of teeth. 
This can be observed in specific instances. Some parents, for example, came to me and said that something terrible had happened to their child. The boy had stolen something. I told them that maybe that event had a different meaning for the child, that perhaps the child was not a thief. I asked how old the child was and the parents said he was five. I then asked what had actually happened. They said that the child had opened a drawer and taken some money. The child bought some candy and gave some of it to other children. I told the parents that they could, that they should certainly not allow this to continue, but that the child only repeated what he saw almost every day. His mother would go to the drawer, take out some money and buy something. The child was only imitating and did not do it as something bad, but as something that was natural within the principle of imitation. Before the change of teeth, therefore, parents should not think that preaching and making good rules will have a positive effect on the child. Those things have no significance for a child during this period of development. Rules are simply noise to the young child's ears. Furthermore, in everything they do, parents must act in a way that the child may be allowed to imitate them. That is the best guide for child-rearing during this period. When you consider the current situation a little, you discover that it is not at all extreme to say that schools receive very few well-behaved children. The basic principle of doing nothing, saying nothing, even thinking nothing that would spoil the imitating child is not yet widely recognized. What does this principle of imitation mean? When we consider the principle of imitation during the first years of the child's life, when we understand that properly observing the principle of imitation can solidify the soul forces, we can then create something in children that enables them to be genuinely independent human beings later. What we sow often blossoms much later in life. Those who were never surrounded by people to whom they could devote themselves through imitation, making everything they did a part of themselves, will be unprepared for democracy and never enjoy independence. We need to consider this connection with life. As I have said, we need to be very clear that the flower and fruit of what we sow in human life often mature much later than people realize. What we sow through the proper principle of imitation during the first seven years of life imprints deeply in a child's soul and finally comes to fruition at the age of twenty then for the rest of life. <clears throat> it is generally true that when children are not brought up to pray, they cannot bring blessing to others later in life. What children learn often transforms in later life into exactly the opposite. Prayer transforms into blessing, and so on. The time of primary importance for school comes next, the, pr the period between the change of teeth and puberty. During this time, the growing human being has a different basic development principle. If you really study human beings, you will observe that this developmental principle is a feeling for authority. When you raise a child during that period without a feeling for authority, certain forces of thinking, feeling and willing cannot be developed. These need to be developed in the growing human being between approximately the ages of 6 and 15 when children need to progress to viewing others in such a way that they can say what that person says is true. Children, of course, do not say that, but they should have that sense. We can never learn to look for truth in life if we have not first looked for it in someone who is an authority for us. If we do not place children in a position where, as their teachers, we become their absolute authority, it will be impossible to develop certain capacities of human nature in them. In this regard, a kind of sacred feeling for authority needs to be present in the school. If you think that something other than this sacred feeling for authority leads to an understanding of democracy and social responsibility, if you believe that a dem democratic school organization leads to that goal, then you are surely on the wrong track. If you want adults that have inner maturity when confronted with democratic and social life, then they must learn as children to look up to their teachers as authorities. This is of primary importance in the atmosphere of the school if you want to educate children in a way that meets the needs of our time. 
When children between the ages of seven and fourteen develop so that they reach out to become the other person, so to speak, who is their authority, then they develop into well-rounded human being, into the well-rounded human being they are meant to be. A well-rounded human being will develop only when we have a deep pedagogical understanding of the many things children need during that time. We can say that the most important thing, particularly for that period of development, is the child's connection with authority. You may know the remark made by Jean Paul that in the first three years of childhood we learn more about life from our nanny than we learn in three years at the university. That is how things were during Jean Paul's life. This remark is certainly correct, and one cannot argue with it. You must also realize, however, that many things depend on a child's physiology. Children should be handling, handled properly regarding memory. Let me read that again. Children should be handled properly regarding memory. A child notices and remembers as much as necessary before the change of teeth. With the change of teeth, however, it becomes necessary to take the child's memory into consideration. <clears throat> it is important during that time that we do not overburden the memory, that we don't try to impress something onto the memory that falls out on its own. Again, as a result of poor modern psychology, people would not believe how bad it is for a human being when the memory is so mistreated during the first period of life that they immediately forget what they are forced to remember. This is why we should, whenever possible, use repetition and similar means. Repetition should be the basis of education between the age of seven and fourteen or fifteen. Whenever possible, we should summarize in short sentences things previously presented in detail so that they can be remembered, so that children really retain certain things in a way similar to how Christ remembered the Lord's Prayer. They should repeat something again and again and thus make it a part of the soul life. We should always remember that during that period of the child's life we should always consider the child's developing soul forces. During this time we make many mistakes by giving more attention to the school subjects demanded by life and by the state than we do to the developing human being. Common everyday things such as reading and writing, lack the inner basis of, say, geometry and arithmetic. The fact that we have the language we have is not fundamentally connected with anything external or generic. The existence of written letters doesn't have much to do with relationships in the world, whereas the existence of a triangle is based on the fact of its three sides and that the sum of its angles is 180 degrees. All conventions, such as reading and writing, are primarily useful for developing the intellect and, in particular, reasoning. For now, it would be too much to fully explain that statement in a way acceptable to a genuine psychologist, but those who consider life fully will certainly see the truth of that statement. By comparison, everything that corresponds to general relationships in the world or appeals to human memory such as history or geography, is more connected, oddly enough, with the feeling forces. It forms feeling. <clears throat> Everything we teach young children about art forms the will. We should teach individual subjects with an eye on the developing human being, and always remember that we form thinking with one thing, feeling with another, and willing with yet another thing. The important thing is the developing human being, not any particular collection of knowledge. When we use these principles, children learn something seldom learned these days. They learn many things today, such as geography, arithmetic, drawing, and so on. But I don't want to speak about them. Children should learn as I just described, but there is not enough being taught about how to learn. Life itself is the greatest teacher. We leave school properly only if we leave with the capacity to learn from life for the rest of our years. But this is impossible if in school we are merely filled with facts. It becomes possible only when we use school to develop in the human soul the forces of thinking, feeling, and willing. That's how we learn 
to learn from life. If we want democracy and a socialized society, then we should not be so arrogant that we think we are able to determine or know everything. We must move beyond delusions of grandeur, beyond the belief that once we reach twenty-one we will be reasonable, self-sufficient adults suited for election to Parliament to speak as people of experience. Rather, we must be educated in inner human modesty so we can recognize that we are not, even for a moment, complete as human beings. Instead, we continue to develop from birth until death. We must recognize that every day of life has a special value, that it is not without purpose that we must learn to live through our thirties, right after we have just gone through our twenties. We need to learn that each new day and each new year offers continual revelation. What I have just said must become a real fact of life through our efforts in schools. During the scientific age, these things could not be considered properly. Certain principles crept into schools. For example, something that, considered from a certain perspective, is appropriate may be seen from a different viewpoint as questionable. For example, providing visual examples of everything. I always get a small chill up my spine when I enter a classroom and see a calculator which allows children to see how numbers are added. This can be done with arithmetic, but only to a small degree. Exaggerating the idea of providing visual examples, we could say that it would be justified as a teaching method only if we could visually illustrate everything in the world. But do you actually believe that everything in the world can be illustrated? There are many things in the world we cannot see, such as feeling, volition, sympathy, aversion, and so on. There is no way to illustrate such things. Teachers must present them to the student through a kind of fluid medium, if I may use that expression, through the principle of authority. From the perspective of cultural history, that is very important. <clears throat> Today it is apparent that we really educate children too intellectually especially in the West. We teach children what they need for life based on reason. The program based most on reason is Marxism, which is completely intellectual. The essential characteristic of Marxism is its structure, which comes only through the intellect. People really understand Marxism only when they realize that it is dictated entirely by the intellect and sharp, even overly sharp, though comfortable reasoning. In any case, it is based on the intellect. In human nature and in the human soul, various soul forces balance one another. If one force overdevelops, the others are left behind. If the intellectual forces are overdeveloped, emotions remain at a lower level. You would then be strong but without feeling. You would be dry. We see, therefore, that in our time of the intellect the most chaotic emotions and the most terrible instincts arise as historical demands. This is coming to us here in Europe from the East and beginning to overpower Central Europe. In other words, basic instinctive demands that form intellectualism's counterpart. I hope people begin to consider these interconnections. As an example, there are two truly principled bourgeois philosophers One of them, Avenarius, is more of a natural scientist of the 19th century. The other is Mach. One lived in Zurich, where he taught, the other in Vienna. Avenarius and Mach attained the highest level of conventional scientific mentality, and they turned that mentality into a philosophical teaching. (coughs) Why? Because their principle was everything for them to use, whenever possible, only what can be observed through the natural sciences toward human knowledge. They were truly very upstanding, good citizens, highly principled, I can assure you. But the philosophies developed by Avenarius and Mach have become the philosophy of the Bolshevik state in Russia. The connection might seem inexplicable. Superficially, we might say that it is because many Bolsheviks studied in Zurich, That doesn't explain it, however, because philosophies do not please someone who lacks an inner connection with them. 
They are connected by what their purely scientifically observable thinking represents. This is so one-sided that, through a hidden aspect of human nature, it awakens emotions and basic instincts in Bolshevism. It is not mere chance. There is an inner principle behind it. No one should consider these ideas more than teachers, because such matters are a profound part of cultural teaching methods. We need to ask how we should educate children. At present we cannot allow ourselves to simply rely on confused, formal teaching methodology. We must include cultural history when creating a healthy program. Consequently, we need to balance the principle of observation with something that forms volition. For example, we have tried to replace mere physical gymnastics, which considers only limb movement, with eurythmy, which is an ensouled human movement. <clears throat> there may be some objections to this, but it is certainly in line with what I just suggested. People will eventually see that it is a way of ensouling gymnastics as much as it is an art, and that it can help education do something important with the will. Similarly, we must change many entrenched beliefs if we want a truly human education that allows people to grow properly into democracy and socialism. Otherwise, democracy and socialism will become a terrible plague for civilized people. Primarily, we must consider that when people are educated, they must acquire the capacity to practice what democratic socialism requires. This is necessary since people want a voice in legal matters and economics through various advisory committees, which are intended to replace the effects of capitalism with the reason of works committees, transportation committees, and economic committees. Democratic socialism should not be just one more demand, but should also represent a system of human rights and responsibilities. This is the degree of thoughtfulness needed to approach such matters today. In particular, we should take what lies behind the demands for democracy and socialism seriously and bring that into our teaching methods and education. If people are to develop genuine insight into the needs and capacities of others, if our society is to become truly social, then through the principle of imitation and the principle of authority, they develop within themselves the capacity for love that brings genuine fraternity to life. Without a feeling for human fraternity, socialism is a paper knife. Things would go badly if teachers were not asked to help reform our society, since the wind that brings health to our times blows only from the direction of education. I can easily believe that during this transitional period, Teachers, in particular, may have serious doubts about how to create a school that educates with the same goal as the union for a threefold social order. That union sees the impossibility of working in this direction as long as schools are dependent on and permeated by the state. Many socialists should also consider this a little, since to a certain extent they want to socialize everything under government control. The social class that preceded the socialists placed their schools under government control. Schools are now completely under the control of the state, and we can surely learn what state control is by looking at that situation. Under the current plea for socialization, those who are serious and see things from a cultural and historical perspective have to acknowledge the importance of freeing the school from the state. Thus, a basic principle of the union for a threefold social order is to work toward an independent school system, making it free of the state, so that the state does not even inspect schools. The activity of self-administered schools should arise purely from cultural needs, and much can grow from that. I want to present an example so you can better understand this comprehensive subject. We differentiate today between elementary grades, high schools, and colleges. Teaching methodology is also taught in the colleges. Now, people want to improve the status of pedagogy, but it is taught, still taught as a secondary subject. Until now, someone would be appointed professor of philosophy and then had to teach pedagogy also. 
Mostly it was a burden and not done very willingly. But this must change. In the future all of culture must connect with human life in general. If we are to fulfill the ideal I described, teachers will also have to be psychologists. Teachers will have to educate the growing child through a deep understanding of the human being and therefore know best what is pedagogically correct. In the future universities will appoint school teachers to teach pedagogy. And after teachers have done that for a while, they will return to their schools to teach children and to gain new experiences in order to teach pedagogy once again. That will be a genuine, quote-unquote, academic republic, as Klopstock dreamt of it. We will not be able to progress until we view matters as thoroughly and deeply. It is, it is the destiny of our time to inform practical life about such things. In order to do that, everything cultural must be independent. The worst thing that could happen would be if the state, through coercion, no longer pays what the teacher needs. The situation for teachers would then be very bad. Nevertheless, teachers are a part of the economic process, just like everyone else. Aside from being teachers, these people will also be members of the third aspect of the threefold social order, the economic aspect and will receive salaries from that independent economic system. The threefold social order will have an independent economic body, just as it has an independent legal body that will, be, that will democratically take care of legal matters. Similarly, it will also have an independent cultural realm. What today goes into the pockets of teachers indirectly through taxes will in the future come directly from the economic aspect of society. Apart from that, an independent culture will foster the appropriate atmosphere for schools and teaching. A proper evaluation of various goods and services also belongs to a healthy society. There must be an evaluation of goods and services. A healthy society, however, cannot see what a teacher actually gives to the coming generation as something to be purchased. What the teacher extends to other human beings is a gift from the spiritual world. A healthy society must understand that teachers are the medium through which human capacities or individual human characteristics are brought out of their dark shadows, where they exist as a part of human nature. It is simply conventional narrow-mindedness to believe in paying according to what is actually accomplished in the schools. The economic portion of the healthy threefold social order has to provide the possibility for teachers to live as others do. In our thinking, we need to strictly separate the potential for earning a livelihood and our evaluation of teaching. There can be no democracy without this healthy impulse. Democracy that equalizes everything and doesn't know the value of things will destroy everything, and socialism that believes everything can be paid for will destroy life itself. It is not just a matter of listening to teachers when moving toward democracy and socialization, but the assessment of teaching must also arise from an understanding of a healthy society. <clears throat> the purpose of the union for a threefold social order is to see that each of these areas of life becomes independent. Therefore, it wants to base everything on an appropriate, healthy foundation. Everything that until now formed a disorganized, chaotic whole, in other words, the economy, the culture, and the state, should each become independent, an independent culture, an independent democratic state, and an independent social economy. Human beings thus become the unifying element of those three aspects. People participate in all three areas so we need not fear the loss of unity. Some people believe that the threefold social order we are working toward would, so to speak, split a horse into three parts. They don't have the right picture of our goal. We are not trying to divide the horse into three parts. We simply want people to stop saying that a horse is real only when standing on one leg. The healthy social organism stands on three healthy legs an independent cultural realm to which education and schools belong, an independent realm of legal rights to which the democratic state belongs, and an independent economy that is social. 
If we want to socialize legal rights and culture even more so, then we would not have socialism in culture or legal rights, much less in the economy. Let me read that again. If we want to socialize legal rights and culture even more so, then we would not have socialism in culture or legal rights, much less in the economy. <clears throat> that would result in a uniform economic life that could clothe and feed people while slowly draining every anything that might develop independently, that is, the legal and cultural realms. This is a serious matter for both elementary and cultural pedagogy. It is an essential and comprehensive question right now. In this rather long lecture, I have attempted as much as possible to show what the impulse of the threefold social order really is, and in particular what it wants to free from bondage. I particularly wanted to show what it wants to achieve in freeing culture, schools, and education from the bonds that currently restrain them. I would be extremely pleased if the underlying ideas I have presented would find interest and attention among teachers and instructors. <clears throat> that apparently is the end of the formal lecture. These are the concluding remarks. In the following lively discussion, Someone objected that proletarian children have been spoiled by bad examples and were unfit as the quote-unquote new human being. Someone presented the idea that it would be better to replace authority with the leadership and obedience that were part of current school goals. The teacher's personality determines education, regardless of political context. <clears throat> A new way of training teachers to be independent is needed. But... Today, teachers need the authority of the state behind them. The state gave teachers authority and had not disturbed them further, and consequently we cannot dispense with the state. First, I would like to answer your questions. The chairman's question about proletarian children was first. Perhaps I sounded as though I would designate the proletariat as the, quote, prototype of the new human being, unquote. I ask that you do not understand this to mean that the new human being would be some kind of angel. Whenever something new is discussed, people make the common error of assuming that new always means better, <clears throat> especially when discussing further human development. The idea of the proletariat as the paragon of the new human is the primary error of cliché-ridden party programs. For them, new is always better. I have not declared the proletariat the prototype of a better human being. I intended to say only that the proletariat exemplifies human beings who have developed during the past period, during the past three or four centuries, particularly the 19th century. When I said that bourgeois parents spoiled their children, I also said that proletarian children were spoiled. I ask that you remember what else I said. The proletarian children were not spoiled by their parents because the parents have no time for that. Modern proletarian children are usually more rowdy than bourgeois children. We can easily agree on that. What the chairman who teaches proletarian children experiences in that regard is not as terrible as he thinks, as I see it. It could be imagined that proletarian children are so rowdy precisely because they exemplify the new human being, but the reason really lies elsewhere. The reason is not that those parents belong to a certain social class and therefore the child imitates certain class characteristics. To put it bluntly, those children are brought up on the street and left alone, and they imitate all kinds of things. In general, they are in a bad situation. They have grown up among a part of humanity where there is nothing particularly good to imitate. Those children have grown up among a broad segment of humanity, so they exist much as the proletariat exists later. They have been raised by life. In contrast, bourgeois children have been more or less confined in a hothouse. That is the difference. There is no question that proletarian children imitate all kinds of things and arrive at school with the results of that imitation, imitating things that are not very desirable. I thought it was important to show how the proletarian child develops when confronted with new tasks. First, because the child has no specific class characteristics from the parents, 
and second, because the child does not enter life as a protégé of a father, mother, brother, or sister, aunt, uncle, or others. The proletarian child must depend on what is developed in the soul. We repeatedly hear the phrase of a man who was not exactly exemplary in his work, quote, success comes to those who work hard, unquote. Such things, however, have become mere clichés. It is easy to say, quote, success comes to those who work hard, unquote, when speaking about a nephew or younger sibling. We need to look at these things objectively and not just hear the words. We live far too much in slogans because we so seldom view matters objectively. I ask you to consider this. This is what I have to say about imitation. Regarding authority, it is natural that proletarian children do not often bring much feeling for authority to school. This is precisely what we need to work for, however, in developing and strengthening teaching methods. We need to develop, particularly in proletarian children, a real feeling for authority. Someone also mentioned that it doesn't matter whether the person charged with developing, thinking, feeling, or willing in a child does so within or outside the structure of the state. In spite of the fact that this question came up twice, I really cannot understand it. The important thing is that we do not rob teachers of their strengths of personality by forcing them to work within the confines of government regulations. You need only consider what it would mean if what entered the child's head did not come out of the free work of the teacher, but instead arose through regulations, curricula, and goals determined by the state. Think of what it would mean if education did not fully develop children, but instead turned them into people required to serve the state in the proper way and at the proper place as the state deems fit. There was also an objection, one that always arises whenever this question is discussed, that the concern and desire for education is not very great right now. Be parents would be happy if they did not have to send their children to school. Someone even said that no one should send their children to school. What I said, though, it was in no way related with the superficial question of whether or not we should send children to school. In my book titled Toward Social Renewal, I speak about the child's right to education and that in the future an educational subsidy will be required from the economy. I am not saying those who would rather send their children out into the field than to school will not perceive compulsory education as a burden. What I am saying is that in a healthy society the child has a right to education. Now you could say, that if the child has that right, then the state will still exist as a legal institution. I do not know why people beat up on the state so much today as one speaker did. Today my intention was to speak only about cultural institutions. Here someone might make the objection, if we recognize the child's right to an education, then parents will send their children to school and we could, therefore, retain compulsory schooling. However, that has nothing to do with putting culture on its own two feet, making it independent, and it also has nothing to do with what is done in schools or in terms of school administration. <laughs> Recently I said about the same question that if we had no compulsory schooling but the right to education existed, we could even turn things around so that those parents who do not want to send their children to school would lose their rights regarding the child's education and would be replaced by a guardian. The children would then, of course, go to school. These secondary questions can be answered if, with good intent, we genuinely understand the main point, which is to understand that everything depends on a free and independent culture. Someone brought up another problem, that is, when the state, or life in general, does not accept what the teacher as an authority has planted in the children. However, it is the possibility that of that difference that demands the separation of the educational system from the state, to make it impossible for the state to reject what has been placed into the child's soul through authority in the school. We need to place the school and the educational system firmly on their own feet. If the state has no authority over the teacher, then when someone is later forced to do something, 
That person will not think of a former teacher as worthless now that the state says it needs something else. That person will think back and feel the heavy burden of fate that he or she cannot carry out what the authority of the teacher placed in their soul. If you think about this in detail, you can see that the solution of this dilemma re already exists. Because this dilemma has been lying for so long on people's souls, the demand for an independent spiritual life, and in particular an independent educational system, has arisen from observation of life. All such things, and several dilemmas have been mentioned, can occur only when the educational system is placed into something with a democratic basis, a realm of legal rights. <clears throat> From my perspective, what Mrs. B. said about authority was so abstract and theoretical that I do not believe it could have any practical significance in real life. For what I said, no one could think that I would suggest that children should decide whether or not a teacher is an authority. Such things result from the atmosphere of life itself. <clears throat> in connection with the question of who will become teachers in the future, for several, for several reasons a selection will not simply happen by examination or by simply knowing certain things, under certain circumstances, a person can acquire such knowledge in only a few hours. You can find it in various handbooks. It is important, however, to consider the personalities and essential talents of the teachers. Of course, I am not implying that if you did not already have some knowledge of these things, you could easily learn them in a few hours. I mean that if you had some prior knowledge of a subject, you can easily relearn it when you need it again. <clears throat> the important thing is to have a certain guarantee about how a teacher becomes a teacher, a guarantee that the person and the entire personality exist in human culture in such a way that the teacher effectively convey conveys authority to the students. These are things we need to consider much more deeply and much more fundamentally than we do when people speak of leadership and following or communal leadership of the school and so on. I ask you to recall what I said about school community. <clears throat> it is important that you hear things as I said them and do not translate them into an abstract program already created for yourself. There is also much to say about the separation of church and state. Historically, there was, for a long time, no alternative to having the school depend on some way in the, on the church. More recently, the state has done a good deed by freeing education from the church and placing it on its own feet. However, now we have a situation where the school depends on the state, and we need to improve that by returning the school to its own footing. We need to recognize that these things can be seen in a one-sided, argumentative way. I often hear remarks that are not quite objective when people speak about such things today. Nevertheless, we need to be clear that it is inappropriate to work towards standardizing human souls through future educational methods or school organization. We cannot rule that something is valid in all cases for the spirit and soul and then require that it be taught to children. We must be able to place ourselves into the souls of those who think and feel differently. <clears throat> it is important that we do not become afraid when, for example, Catholic parents demand that their children receive instruction in Catholicism. We don't have to fear that when we stand firmly on our own foundation. Similarly, we don't need to fear the world view of another if we are enthusiastic and strong in our own. Such attitudes can develop in free spiritual competition, but certainly not through laws. It is harmful when a church becomes the church of state through laws, when all the advantages of state with all the advantages of state protection, but it is just as bad when the state persecutes a church. The state should not support or persecute any attitude of soul in any way. If you begin with such thoughts and think them through sufficiently, you will discover that it is indeed necessary to make culture and in particular education free and independent. <clears throat> what was said about the authority 
exercised by the teacher that young people should free themselves of it and not retain it throughout life was either obvious or something was misunderstood. It is obvious that one should not go through life with the teacher's authority in the background. Such authority could cause a person to ask within, what would it be like if I were a teacher? What the teacher placed in that person's soul as authority would become that individual's own authority. Nevertheless, we must look at such matters much more thoroughly and with greater depth, because the authority of the teacher can indeed remain throughout one's life. I have said that what a teacher provides in education cannot really be paid for. Payment involves something very different. In education, the relationship between the teacher and the student can be developed in such a way that the teacher can remain an authority throughout a person's entire life. I ask you if there could be anything more beautiful than when, as an older person, say sixty years old, you can look back at your youth and recall a teacher and say that such a person was a true authority for you. Is there anything more beautiful than being able to say you are grateful for that teacher's gifts to you, and that as a consequence you became what you are today? People can retain that kind of authority, and it can live through a lifelong gratitude toward a teacher. The psychology appropriate to the tasks of today must include such things. <coughs> Someone said that the state is necessary, or that we could replace it with some sort of cultural senate or some such thing. What I actually said was that those who have not felt the compulsion of the state have not actually experienced it. You see, the reality is that it is now second nature for people to want to be teachers employed by the state. When that has become second nature, you are no longer aware that it is not really your free and independent self who teaches from the source of culture, Instead, you have become accustomed to the state and to presenting what the state offers for instruction. You think you are free, but that feeling of freedom, especially the way people now feel, <coughs> is certainly no proof that you really are free. <coughs> I would like to mention a person, Woodrow Wilson, who is a great world teacher, according to many people. And his book, titled Concerning Freedom, where he gives a strange definition of freedom, he defines it in such an odd way that it could make you climb the walls. Wilson says, roughly, that we can call a mechanism free that has no boundaries and works in whatever way required. He also says that we could call a, a ship free when it moves in a certain way according to the same principle. However, this mechanical freedom is not what we are talking about. It is something we have to feel. There was also a great deal of discussion about many things that I certainly didn't say. Particularly, the man who defended the state said several such things, but I didn't say anything at all about the present state. Those who understood me properly will recall what I said, that the goals of modern socialists threaten to bring one thing or another to pass, and thus what could occur is exactly what should not happen. Consequently, we must arrange things in a certain way. Now, I certainly cannot go into things that others merely misconstrued from my words and then turned into an argument. There is, however, one thing I do wish to address, that also there needs to be an authority for teachers. I have not said anything about the authority that teachers need, but only that teachers should be an authority for the child. Whether or not there is an authority for teachers is a totally different question, and it can be answered by saying that ultimately life itself takes care of that. Look at how life really is. This is something we consider far too little today. When you look at the way life really is, you have to admit that people are different from one another. You will have to admit that in the end, someone who could be an authority in any one of many ways will always find a higher authority. Thus everyone will always find an authority above themselves in real life. <clears throat> of course, we do not need to go to an extreme here. Someone can be an authority simply because that person is more capable in some things. When I spoke of Klopstock's ac academic republic, I did not mean that everyone could do as they wish. 
It is much closer to the truth that people will not just do what they want to do, but that they will do what is required by culture in order to make it as fruitful as possible. There will be a voluntary acquiesce to authority. <clears throat> in an independent culture we can certainly conceive of a constitution that isn't based on rigid laws and petrified governmental rulings, but one based rather on real, living relationships among those who participate in it. We must, of course, first replace to quote the law and quote with free personal and flexible human relationships that are therefore not bound by rigid laws carved in stone for eternity it is important that we give culture the opportunity to live in a form that arises from the forces already existing within it so that teachers are not in some way dependent on a bureaucrat teachers must depend in an upright objective way that results from culture itself. They must depend on others directly involved in culture and who are just as active culturally as the teacher. This is important. <clears throat> you can see today that there is a kind of fear of an independent culture and that many feel much safer under the state's protection. That is exactly the problem, that so many people feel good under state protection and state protection will become even more desirable to people in the future. Over the last several centuries, the state gained power through earlier conquests and so on, and then individuals wanted to connect themselves with that power for their own protection. For a while the church did that. The church wanted not only the living word that flowed from the spirit, which could affect and convince people, but it also wanted the police to provide a little extra help. Others followed, including the educational system. In regard to education, people preferred not to have what was brought from the Spirit affect the child, but to have the state's mandate behind it. <clears throat> then there were the various economic classes and organizations, and finally those corporations, in Germany mostly those in heavy industry, who also wanted to have some of the state's power. Now we have the social democrats who want to take over the state for themselves. Thus the power of the state became the reservoir for everything. In the future we need to make sure that state power is no longer the refuge of whoever wants power. We need to give the state a democratic basis. It is important that the state be on a firm foundation where every adult is treated equally. We will then be working with a state of rights. It is odd that today's people don't want to recognize that even though a comprehension of such relationships nearly occurred within that sphere of rights when there was a Prussian minister of culture, you find in his title Limits of the State some hint of what the state should really be. He's speaking about von Humboldt, I believe. If the state is to be democratic, however, then it may include only what relates one adult human being to another. We should remove culture from the state and also exclude the economy from the state, especially when it concerns economic experience, credit, and so on. That means that if someone seriously wants democracy, such a person cannot at the same time want socialism and culture to be included in the state. That person would have to admit that to achieve democracy the only healthy thing is to separate culture and economic activities as free and independent. The fact that people have not realized this, which is certainly the case in Russia, results in the so-called dictatorship of the proletariat through the extremely undemocratic, even anti-democratic goals of the modern economy. <clears throat> I was confronted with this in a very crude way a few months ago in Basel. Following one of my lectures, someone who was apparently a communist stood and said that in order to secure a healthy future, Lenin must become ruler of the world. Such people call for socialization, but they haven't the slightest understanding of what social is. They do not understand that we must first socialize the ruling relationships. Socialization does not consist of making the ruling relationship a monarchy, of making socialism imperial. People think they want to socialize, 
but they have no desire whatsoever to begin by socializing the relationships in government. Instead, they want to make some economic pope ruler of the entire world. That is how people think. These are the contradictions that arise today. For that reason, I hope you have a feeling that the things expressed in the threefold social order are based on something deeper. I did not come to the idea of the threefold order through random abstract principles or what people commonly accept as belief. There are certainly a number of things that seriously need proper foundations, but the impulse for a threefold social organism arose from genuine, serious observation of life and from the feeling of serious concern for the primary cultural tasks today. If you honestly want socialism and democracy, then you cannot merely want what people often call social democracy, since in that case culture is not properly considered. Above all, those who honestly want democracy and socialism need a genuinely free cultural life, not something arbitrary. The impulse for a threefold organization resulted from a recognition of reality and a feeling for the seriousness of contemporary relationships. We here in Central Europe should particularly appreciate the gravity of our time, a time when we have to acknowledge this as a question of life or death and the need to rethink and relearn many old things. We cannot simply attempt small changes in various institutions. What we need is a genuine rethinking, a transformation in our feeling and fresh learning. Only in that way can we understand our time and really progress. <laughs>